Josh Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. The darkness at the heart of Africa is not the Africans, it's colonialism, whether of the old-fashioned European type or the new modern American type of colonialism. European colonialism for more than a, ha a century and a half cut a swathe through Africa, stole everything that they could move, including, of course, a large number of the people. Belgian colonialism killed 10 million people in the Congo. British colonialism gobbled up half of the colonies in Africa at the very least. Portuguese colonialism, Spanish colonialism, Italian colonialism all cut their sway through the continent of Africa. But the most enduring, at least on the superficial level of European colonialism is of course France. And the French are now being kicked out of Africa, starting in Mali. And we are going to focus on that this evening. And what about Justin Trudeau? An award, surely, for hypocrite of the 21st century. Out there on the public steps, denouncing China for its lockdown policies when he jackbooted his way across Canada and across Canadians for their anti-lockdown protests. Ditto in the United States. People who protested the lockdown were called Donald Trump's shock troops by Joe Biden, who said that the vaccine was 100% effective. If you get it, you won't catch COVID, he said. I saw his lips moving. We'll be talking about the United States also and about China from the front line in China where, according to Western media, all hell has broken loose. Although, of course, you won't be surprised to learn that the truth is rather different. Fasten your seatbelts. As Betty Davis said, it's going to be a bumpy night here on the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. This first hour is brought to you by our sponsor, Critical Cosmetics, my good friend Ravi. I'm actually snowed under now with these samples. These are face and hair products, literally good enough to eat, and I have eaten them. And this one in particular, maple pistachio, is to die for. Thank you, Ravi, for your ongoing sponsorship of the first hour of the mother of all talk shows. Some big news coming from Critical Cosmetics later in the hour about their 16 new flavors and their 10 pack samples coming soon. Millions of people watched all or part of the mother of all talk shows over the last 10 days. I mean millions of people. I can only be specific about the 2.59 millions who watched all or part of the mother of all talk shows on the mainstream platforms that can be checked right now by any one of you. 2.59 million in 10 days. But I cannot count the viral quality of the pirate clip which has now been re-pirated and re-pirated in Arabic in particular all over the world. But I can hazard a guess that at least another 2.59 million have seen that clip. I mention it not just because I'm proud of it. Why wouldn't I be? Why wouldn't my team be? But to show to you that you are a part 
of a family now growing vast, dwarfing all other comparable television ventures anywhere in the world. If I tell you that BBC Question Time tomorrow night will get an audience of around 220,000, you can put into perspective the kind of numbers that we are now racking up with no advertising budget, with no cross-media fertilization, not a single person or organ of the mainstream media ever mentions the existence of the mother of all talk shows. This is all down to you. It's you who have kept this audience growing and it's your word of mouth that is ensuring it is into the stratosphere now. And Ravi, our sponsor for the first hour, will need to be joined by a new sponsor for our second hour. I'll talk about that very shortly. Now, I was very privileged to be there in Havana, in Cuba, when Fidel Castro, 30 years ago or more, denounced the so-called NGOs, non-government organizations they call themselves. Back then, there were some non-government organizations. I myself was the head of one of them for three years in the 1980s. But increasingly, those NGOs really should drop the end because they are government organizations. Fidel called them Trojan horses and banned them from Cuba and called upon all like-minded leaders throughout the developing world to kick these Trojan horses out of their gates. And it was a perfect crystallization of what I, even in the 1980s, had begun to see. These NGOs, whilst no doubt their volunteers and some at least of their staff are not doing it for the increasingly large salaries, but out of the goodness of their hearts, a kind of vocation, the people that volunteer in charity shops and so on, I make no criticism at all of them. But these organizations increasingly are a tool for the Western governments, which increasingly supply most of their money. The bigger the charity, the bigger the NGO, the more likely their state, or in the case of the EU, an agglomeration of states, are funding their operations. And of course, there's no such thing as a free lunch. That lunch comes with strings, and those strings are that these NGOs increasingly have to follow the diktat, and some of them do it very willingly indeed, of the so-called human rights narrative of the so-called rules-based order, which is effectively American rules and the basis of international relations over the unipolar period, which is now rapidly coming to an end. The United States and its loyal satrapies decide what the rules are with no legal basis whatsoever, never mind a decision of the world's governing body, the United Nations and its Security Council, and they ruthlessly impose them on countries. They send in the economic hit men to do the job and hope that by strapping a yoke of indebtedness onto developing countries, they can keep them in line, secure their votes in the United Nations, get their level of debt through international institutions that they control, like the World Bank and the IMF. But if the economic hit men don't work, then the jackals come next. The jackals kill people. That's their job. If the economic hitman doesn't get you, the jackal will get you. And if the jackal can't get you, as in the case of Fidel Castro, for example, then the military is more than ready to move in. In some cases, all three are present at the same time. Mali is a case in point. In the French colony of Mali, the economic hitmen were in for a very long time. 
the jackals have been ever present. The day of the jackal in Mali has been every day since independence. And even the French military, the so-called Foreign Legion, have been repeatedly sent, interposed into internal affairs in Mali. And murder and mayhem has been the result. But Mali now has a president that is standing up to French colonialism. And he has booted out the Trojan horses of the French so-called NGOs. We'll be talking to an Africa expert on this very subject in just a few minutes' time. I mentioned Trudeau earlier, hypocrite of the 21st century. I myself think that he wins that prize out of the park for a whole range of things. You've seen him in blackface, though he is achingly concerned about anything that might possibly be described as racism. And you see him now denouncing China for its attitude to lockdown protests when he led his own stormtroopers, who included a cabinet discussion about sending in the Canadian military to destroy the truckers' protest against COVID-19 protests in his own country of Canada. He didn't, in the end, send the army, but he sent the Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, by the score, by the hundreds. He froze the bank account of those truckers, blue-collar workers, who were merely protesting the restrictions on their ability to work for a living and feed their families on what they regarded, whether they were right or wrong, as a bogus scientific and medical prospectus. He literally stole their money. He froze their bank accounts. He hunted down in association with the U.S. government of Joe Biden, the personal bank accounts of American donors to those trucker protesters. He denounced as Trumpian, even fascist, anyone who stood up to the zero COVID pretensions of the great pretender, Justin Trudeau. But when the Chinese came onto the streets in Comparatively small numbers, China is a country of 1.5 billion people after all, out came Trudeau onto the steps with the microphone, denouncing China and hailing the anti-lockdown protesters in China as freedom fighters. But Trudeau was not alone. The British media, for example, which literally ignored completely the existence of huge protests throughout the United Kingdom, but particularly in London, throughout the COVID-19 emergency, even when those protests were literally under their window in the case of the BBC. Thousands of people rallied outside the BBC, protesting at the perceived one-sidedness of their narrative on the coronavirus crisis, and they didn't even put a camera out of their own window to film it. And if they did, they certainly never broadcast it. It never happened, you see, for the great majority of the British people. And the same was true of all the television companies. Same was true of all the fancy newspapers in Britain and in the United States of America. Countries like Sweden, that took a different line on COVID-19 were regularly denounced as outliers, as outlaws, as renegades, even though now that we look back on it, their record of excess deaths was less than ours and they had none of the economic carnage and other carnage that our policies of COVID created. In the United States, 1.3 million people are said to have died from the coronavirus-19 uh, uh, pandemic. In China, it's 5,000. 
5,000 in a country of 1.5 billion in the United States, almost 1.3 million. You do the maths and see whose approach, whose attitude to coronavirus pandemic measures and lockdowns worked and whose didn't. Now, of course, Chinese people must be desperately tired of the terrific level of restrictions imposed by the Chinese state to keep that 5,000 number down close to where it is. Who wouldn't be? I now look back on the two years of my life that we all partially lost as a result of COVID-19 with something akin to disbelief. Disbelief, in my case, at believing all of the propaganda that the medical profession and the big pharma gave me. Disbelief that our society, our children, our health service, our economy lost so much out of a virus whose, if you like, origin we remain utterly oblivious of. We still don't know if it was man-made. If it was man-made, who made it? And if it was man-made, for what purpose? Did it come from a pangolin or a bat? We don't know any of these things. And yet millions of people have died. And trillions of dollars of economic wreckage lie behind us and are now used to justify the economic freeze that we are now beginning to be in the middle of. Who knows whose approach was right? I don't. Everyone has a different point of view on that. But China's attitude to COVID-19 is China's business, not Trudeau's, not Joe Biden's, not the Guardian's or the New York Times. It is the business of China. And time will tell how effective this latest crackdown on COVID-19 in China turns out to be. And at what cost? Because there's no point in pretending that measures that are taken and that may or may not be successful don't have commensurate damage or impact somewhere else in the economy and in the society. Ursula von der Leyen, the Gauleiter of the European Union Commission, made the mistake of speaking the truth to camera about the death toll of Ukrainian forces in the Russian-NATO-Ukraine war. They cut out it was such a big mistake once it had been broadcast once. But luckily, some clever people captured the first broadcast. And in it, von der Leyen says that more than 100,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed since February 25 of this year, that is to say in less than a year. On the basis that in every war, between 2.5 and 3 times the number of people are wounded as are killed, that means close to half a million casualties in Ukraine in just 10 months. This means the cost of the war that Joe Biden and NATO are insisting must continue has reached stratospheric levels, catastrophic levels. The damage to Ukrainian society will not be recovered from for generations to come. In Kiev now there is no lights and no water and no heating. Although there's always lights for Zelensky's television appearances and his Vogue and Vanity Fair photo shoots. But for the great mass of the suffering people of the great city of Kiev, which I've visited many times, and adored and loved with all my heart. 
are suffering now. You cannot go to the toilet above the second floor of the high-rise buildings in which many, maybe most, of the people of Kiev now live because you need electricity to work the pumps, to work the toilet. Just think about that, if you will. It's very cold here in the United Kingdom on this, the 30th of November, but not nearly as cold as it is in Ukraine. And not nearly as cold in Ukraine on the 30th of November as it will be on the 30th of December, the 30th of January, and the 30th uh, of the 28th of February. It is a nightmare that the people of Ukraine are now living through, and all because of the US and EU organized coup to overthrow the elected government in Ukraine in 2014, and the mass murder of thousands of their own people carried out by the regime that came to power by violent coup, setting their parliament on fire and their president to flee. Those eight years since 2014 have wreaked a death toll which is now reaching catastrophic levels. If van der Leyen is accurate, then the number of dead soldiers and the number of inexorably wounded and maimed soldiers is a scar on the face of Ukraine that will never heal. And of course, all attempts to reach a negotiated settlement, whether brokered by President Erdogan in Turkey or others, have fallen on stony ground because of the absolute insistence of Western leaders that the government in Kiev not conclude a peace with Russia that will satisfy Russia's legitimate security concerns. And so the war goes on, and with General Winter now on the battlefield, the future is bleak indeed. East of the Dnipro, very soon all Ukrainian military units will be destroyed or will have surrendered. And then the focus moves to the south, to Ukraine's coast, to places like Odessa and other great Russian civilizations that have been in the hands of a country which had been handed over to NATO, to the United States of America, and to the Biden crime family itself for the production of deadly pathogens in U.S. owned and controlled bio labs seeded throughout the territory of the Ukraine, but mainly in the east of the country as close as possible to the Russian frontier. I've spoken too long, but it's important what I've had to say. Fasten your seatbelts. It really is the mother of all talk shows. You know, and it's a very, thank you for, you know, I, I'm a big fan of your show, Gigi. Great, great debate, great. And I'm Scottish. I'm very passionate about what's happening there, you know. I had a great mom. She was Scottish, Mary McLeod. She taught me well. She taught me well at everything, including golf. I love Scotland, and I love the Scottish food. It's great food, I said to Melania. You know, haggis, look at that. What's more than, more Scottish than that? Me. I am that haggis. She said, what, thin-skinned and full of crap? You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Here's the numbers to call if you want to comment on what I've had to say, what I didn't say, or what any of the guests say in the course of this show. If you're in the UK or Ireland... The number is 0808196552. That's 0808196552. <coughs> it will cost you nothing at all. You ring us now. Cost free. We'll call you back and put you on the show. If you're in the US and Canada, it's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one 
844-944-3344. Again, toll free. Call us now, toll free, and we'll call you back. If you're in the rest of the world, it's 44-203-966-2625. That's plus 44-203-966-2625. We've also got a poll running. The West is being hypocritical in condemning China's COVID lockdown policies? A, yes, B, no. You can vote on my Twitter feed, on my YouTube channel. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel or my Telegram channel, which is t.me forward slash George Galloway. It is overwhelmingly a yes. On Twitter, 89% yes. On YouTube, 91% yes. And on Telegram, 95% percent yes it makes you wonder what these hypocrites imagine the public to be do they think the public doesn't realize that this is just another stick to beat china with another section of the hellish orchestra that is mustered each section called in whenever it is thought likely to be efficacious. Now we can add another one, COVID lockdown policies. Now, there's a ghost on Twitter, and that ghost is the ghost of Garland Nixon. He's one of my best friends in American media. He's one of our most popular commentators. Yet the real Garland Nixon has been banned in perpetuity by the new regime of Elon Musk that was supposed to be putting an end to all of these things. However, Garland is not an apparition. He's as large as life, and he's here, and always will be, on the mother of all talk shows. Garland Nixon, a welcome. Let's start with your uh, Twitter status. Um, any chance of Musk uh, reinstating you? Well, um, I'm starting to feel that that's less and less likely because um, I was, in fact, uh, for a satirical tweet, it was clearly a comedic tweet. Um, I did a little to-do list for Tony Blinken, and I said, you know, on his to-do list was things such as blow up the Nord Stream pipeline and strangle Palestinians and uh, overthrow the government of um, of Pakistan. It was clearly satire, and um, I received a um, I received a message from. Twitter that said, I will be suspended, but you can appeal. I attempted to appeal, and I immediately got an email that said, you can't appeal, you're suspended for life. Well, a few days later, I decided, well, if I'm suspended for life, why don't I give death a shot? So I opened another account, and I called it Garland Nixon's Ghost, and that lasted a few days, and now that has been, uh, as was the first account, the ghost is now um, a thing of the past. So basically, I'm suspended from Twitter for life. I would add the interesting thing that was that the day that I was suspended, um, Dan Cohen, a great investigative journalist, um, did a bit of investigation on Twitter, and he found that um, a huge number of NAFO trolls had gotten together. They all sent a request to Twitter for me to be um, expelled, and apparently as a result of this organized NAFO troll, which as we know is an intelligence operation from the U.S. government, um, Twitter sent them the responses that said, we received your complaint, and as a result, Garland Nixon has been permanently suspended from Twitter. So, I mean, by proxy, certainly, but it was a government intelligence operation utilizing NAFO trolls to get me suspended for a satirical tweet. And what they said was hate, that is it was hateful conduct. Interestingly enough, since then, a lot of people have sent me many other tweets where people called for assassinations, murders, Donald Trump to be um, a military firing squad, Alan Dershowitz, on all of these other tweets, none of which seem to be hateful conduct. But, you know, I think I stepped on the third rail. I went after the, the empire's uh, foreign policy. Well, uh, in one way, it's a badge of honor, but it deprives the rest of us of the pearls of wisdom and satire that you were famous uh, for. Um, any way of, I mean, Musk says that he's reinstating, uh, I think it's something like 60,000 permanently banned accounts. Why would yours not be among them? 
That's a good question. Well, you know, about a day afterwards, you know, there were, interestingly enough, I don't know if I had anything to do with it. There were probably a number of people, but um, my particular um, account went viral and a lot of people, um, I mean, there were TikTok videos seeing hundreds of thousands of, of, of views, et cetera. And uh, people, you know, basically made a lot of points. This guy's former law enforcement officer. He's former um, national board of directors for the ACLU. He's gotten awards for fighting for free speech and things of that nature for the American Civil Liberties Union. And you're going to throw this guy off for a joke. And uh, but at any rate, within 24 hours, um, Elon Musk did a poll and he said, you know, should I suspend all accounts other than ones who have were involved in criminal activity or egregious spamming? 77 percent of the people said yes. And then he said, you know, Vox Populi, Vox Day, meaning the word of the people is the word of God. It's going to happen next week. So today is Wednesday. According to his edict, uh, according to his claim, that would mean that I would be would be reinstated sometime this week. But again, the question is, does the U.S. Uh, 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 you know, does the U.S. empire still hold some kind of veto power over Twitter so they can just say, yeah, well, you, you, only certain people are, are allowed back on or maybe his claim will be overridden by the U.S., um, the, by the State Department. And they'll say, you know, you can't allow anyone back on. The question is, does he own Twitter? Is he in charge of it? I, I guess we'll see. The week is will be over, what, Saturday night? Yeah, uh, of course, it's not just the uh, U.S. government. The EU issued a public statement today. You'd think they'd be embarrassed. This is a group of countries that call themselves the free world. This is a group of countries that are forever telling us how they cherish freedom and freedom of speech and so on. They issued an edict that Twitter faced a ban in the European Union if it allowed people that it had previously suspended uh, back onto the platform. Uh, I, could, I had to read it twice uh, to actually uh, convince myself that it was real. This is a set of governments openly warning a private media company about who it will be allowed to engage with or uh, to use its uh, platform. So Musk is between the United States government and the EU. To be fair to him, it's not an enviable place. Yes. And well, what's happening here is the truth is coming out. The reality is that we have a discussion about free speech on Twitter, but it's not really about free speech. This is the truth is it is the opposite. It is about the um, the U.S. government, the U.S. empire and its vassals um, putting forward misinformation, disinformation or particular narratives that are extremely brittle and easily debunked. They cannot afford this is, you know, I've referred to this as a um, a, a crisis of an epistemological crisis. How do you know what you know? How what kind of discussion do you have about how the things that we believe those discussions are important in that the U.S. Uh, State Department, NATO, the EU put forward narratives that are absurd and often easily debunked, they cannot afford for people to have critical um, discussions, intellectual discussions involving critical thinking uh, on these platforms to discuss these silly um, uh, narratives that they put forth. So this is, the, the, in a way, it's a good thing because the truth is coming out. They're shutting people down. You know, you can, it, here's the bottom line, you can make hateful, um, violent, vicious comments about people or groups that have been targeted by the U.S. empire and its vassals. But any any members of the U.S. empire or, or, or its vassals or, or, or its particular narratives must be protected at all costs. And the truth is coming out. Now, uh, talking of, uh, of uh, propaganda, uh, what do you make of, uh, I don't know if it's the same in the U.S., but here in uh, Europe and in Canada for sure. There's a, a, an all-out assault on China over its lockdown policies. And there's not even a hint of embarrassment uh, from the people who pursued exactly the same lockdown policies 
and treated the protesters against them as arch criminals, if not fascists. Is it the same in the U.S.? It's it's absolutely the same in, in the in the U.S. And I think about people like you and I who discuss the truckers. If you remember the truckers in um, up in Canada who were doing what they were pushing back against government policies regarding covid. And at the time, you know, they were more conservative people. But I, I'm a left leaning person, but I saw it as a populist movement and I saw it as a positive thing for society. And I supported the, their their right to do that. They were called Nazis uh, from people who actually actually do materially support Nazis right now. There's another bit of irony there, but they were called Nazis. And eventually the Canadian government, you know, sent the 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 uh, the heavy handed uh, guys in the black uniforms in to take them apart. And uh, they um, they had people who contributed to them, had their um, bank accounts frozen. I mean, they did all kinds of totalitarian actions against them. And now there are some um, protests in China. But how about if we start here? You told us it was a totalitarian, authoritarian government and that if there were protests, the people would all be immediately mowed down with machine guns. It seems to me that they are having their right to protest respected it, it, it more so than the truckers in Canada. And as you said, these are the people who were in favor of lockdowns and put down protests that opposed the um, COVID policies here. And now, once again, they're exposing themselves. People are looking at them and, you know, it's a good thing, as far as I'm concerned, when they so blatantly and openly expose the hypocrisy of their policies. They don't really stand for any policies, as it were. It's all about who is the enemy and how can we go. Another human rights um, joke that they're using to go after, to smite their adversaries. Now, uh, the war drags on, uh, Garland, uh, largely at your expense. Uh, though the ultimate price is paid by the dead bodies of Ukrainians and the freezing bodies of those Ukrainians not yet killed in this bloody war, which has now dragged on for the best part of a year, uh, 10 months uh, to be precise. Um, how is it seen from the US? Von der Leyen is caught on camera footage is out today saying that 100,000 Ukrainian soldiers have died in the war, which means that two to three times that number have been wounded, maimed in the conflict. So uh, more than 400,000 people killed or wounded in 10 months. Uh, how many dead Ukrainians is the U.S. government prepared to pay? In a nutshell, all of them until they run out. And then if they can do Poles or Romanians or any other group that they'd be perfectly happy to do that. A big part of the discussion regarding uh, right, particularly now the last few days, um, the big uh, news story in the U.S. regarding that is Emmanuel Macron's visit to um, Washington, D.C. As I said, I'm four blocks from the White House right now in my office. That's K Street right behind me. So Macron's probably not far away. And uh, the news is reporting that uh, significant uh, uh, reports that the um, the Europeans are furious because uh, the United States is profiting greatly, you know, because of the war profiteering. And also the U.S. is um, removing uh, in, you know, is basically deindustrializing um, the EU and bringing the industri industry to the United States and that there's uh, there's a, a, a good amount of enmity coming. What is Macron going to say? And, you know, you and I have discussed that significantly in the past, in my opinion. He's going to he's going to do the same thing that Olaf Scholz came here uh, and did when he was uh, discussing the Nord Stream 2. He's going to keep his mouth shut. He's going to do what he's told. And when he goes back, he's going to do his job. The ruling elite in the EU understand that their job is to pacify the masses in Europe as long as they possibly can, while the United States continues to profiteer and to take the industry of Europe and bring it here. They have to give the illusion. They have to be controlled opposition. Macron, Schultz, etc. They'll pound their fists, they'll weep, and they'll gnash their teeth, and they will try to give their constituents the illusion that they're standing up to fight against the U.S., taking their heavy industry, when in fact they are nothing but collaborators. And I don't know if the European people do, do that, but the, the, here's, here's the truth. The Americans are laughing at them. 
Americans are looking at the Europeans saying, you people are suckers. We all know what they're doing over here. We are sitting here saying we can't believe that you guys are just going to sit there and allow Biden and his people to rob you blind and take your industry. So to be quite frank, I mean, the conversation over here is, well, if the Europeans are suckers, that's what suckers are for. You're supposed to take the money of a sucker. As P.T. Barnum said, it's against the, 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 the laws of God and nature to allow a sucker to keep his money. Now, I feel horrible for the people of Europe because they are being misled and lied to. And, and they truly believe, unfortunately, that their leaders are looking out for them. They're complicit and they're over here helping Biden steal your jobs and they're going to end up with nothing. But that's, the, that's actually the discussion here. Americans understand what's going on and most of us can't believe that the Europeans will just sit there and allow that to happen. I am Garland Nixon. We are all Garland Nixon. If this account is not reinstated by the end of this week, further measures will be organized by the viewers of the mother of all talk shows. Garland, thanks as always for joining us on the moats. The West is being hypocritical in condemning China's COVID lockdown policies. On Twitter, yes, 92, no, 8. On YouTube, yes, 92, no, 8. On Telegram, always the most perspicacious, yes, 95, no, 5. Let me uh, remind you, uh, please, this maple pistachio is mine, but you can have all the others. This first hour is brought to you by Critical Cosmetics. Let me take a very short break, and then we're back with more. The airwaves. This savannah is a rigid dichotomy of fact and fiction. As vicious as the Twitter sphere where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. The George Galloway. The top cat in these parts, it is mostly active on Sunday evenings in Britain and mid afternoon in the United States. It seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Let's go to the phone lines. Cheryl is in Oklahoma. Go ahead, Cheryl. Thank you, Mr. Galloway. And may I call you George? Yes, of course, ma'am. Go <laughs> ahead, please. Well, this is Cheryl. And uh, I have followed you and admired you for so many years. And it's just quite a pleasure, lovely, to talk to you today. And uh, Thank you so much. Oh, well, you, you're more than worth it. <laughs> you deserve it. Um, the reason I called is I don't know whether you've kept up much with the uh, rail workers' strike here in America. And I will fill you in if you haven't. If not, uh, you can give me your view on it. No, uh, please, uh, I I know about it, and I know that Joe Biden has just betrayed them, and I know that the so-called squad progressives have sided with Joe Biden and betrayed the railway workers, but in your words, in a nutshell, tell us what's happened. Well, you're you're right up to then, but the squad pulled a little trick. They refused to give them maybe in seven days of sick leave. They refused to include that in the bill, but they stuck on a provision for seven days of sick leave. 
But that's just for show because the Senate doesn't have to approve the provision. So what they're going to do is they will not. You know, they won't. They'll pass Biden's bill. And the head of the union says the workers will go back to work if they're forced to which I'm hoping they don't. I mean, if they don't stand up now, uh, workers and unions are ruined in America. This is- well, I think that's very powerfully put, uh, Cheryl. Uh, the, 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 we must all hang together or each of us will hang separately. And uh, we have long, bitter experience of our a crack troops uh, in trade union terms being picked off one after the other with the others not joining in when they could, if united, have stopped the defeat of one and therefore ultimately all. Uh, so uh, the railway workers fulfill that role in the United States, a country that is uh, little unionized nowadays. But the railway workers and the transport workers, the Teamsters and so on, are highly organized workers. And if they can be betrayed and defeated, then no one has the power to stand up. Last word to you, Cheryl. Well, uh, that's right. I just uh, think that this is a hill worth dying on. And I really hope Americans say enough is enough, you know, before it's way too late. God bless you. God bless you and the great state of Oklahoma and all the railway workers in the United States of America. Jim is in Ecuador. We're going from Oklahoma to Ecuador. It's a global show. Go ahead, Jim. Hello. How are you? By the grace of God, good and happy to hear from Ecuador. Go ahead. (laughs) Um, I'm calling just to... uh... congratulate you on your coverage of the Ukraine war. Um, recently, uh, I saw a broadcast that uh, Angela Merkel and Boris Prusetko, uh, Prusenko admitted that they uh, deliberately didn't enforce the Minsk Accords and used it to buy time to arm Ukraine to NATO standards instead of protecting the Donbass. Uh, and of course, this makes the phrase unprovoked invasion absurd. Um, Otios, yeah. uh, One other comment um, that I have is uh, there is an organization called the OSCE that monitored uh, uh, strikes on the in Ukraine on the Donbass and um, if I remember watching Biden make an announcement uh, or his uh, press agents uh, saying there was going to be an invasion on the 15th of February. It didn't happen, and everybody laughed, and then he said, I think, on the 17th. And I'm a a retired detective, and I thought, you know, why are they speaking with such certitude? Uh, uh, Aren't they taking a chance? But this organization, OSCE, which monitors, I've I've got the what the oh, it's the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. It's a neutral organization, and they show the amount of explosions in the Donbass. So on February 14th, there were 174, and then it increases, you know, to 500 on the 16th. On the 22nd, there were 1,710. And my point is, it certainly looks like. Russia, you know, that Russia, that this was provoked in the most obvious and uh, meaningful way. So that's about it. Well, uh, you say it's about it, but it's uh, pristine in its brilliance, uh, including the line from Ecuador, uh, a detective retired in Ecuador, making the point that, frankly, no journalist or broadcaster on the lamestream media has ever made, Jim, far from being unprovoked, the OSCE literally recorded the provocations. They literally counted them. Their books are there for inspection. The rising tide of acts of aggression by the Kiev regime against the Donbass are there in black and white 
in the OSCE's reports. The only reason we know that 14,000 people were murdered by the Kiev authorities in the last eight years is because the OSCE recorded all of the dead bodies. Unprovoked aggression. Russia had every right under the United Nations Charter. Indeed, everyone should have been intervening to stop the possible genocide of Russian-speaking people in the east of Ukraine. And if you thought that Russia would sit idly by whilst its co-religionists, its compatriots, were slaughtered by the dwarf on speed in Kiev, then you don't know the Russians at all. Jim, thanks for the call. I'll be in Sunderland on Tuesday the 7th of February. Gayatri will be there with our camera interviewing the uh, people who are in the audience and will broadcast those uh, interviews as we did from uh, Stockport. Uh, there, is, uh, there is there Sunderland if you're anywhere in the northeast of England or indeed the southeast of Scotland, anyone within travelling distance. It's Tuesday, the 7th of February. Get your tickets now. Raphael is on the line from Vermont. Go ahead, Raph. Hey guys, I wanted to talk about uh, that EU thing, you know, about that tribunal, but I'm not going to do it because you guys just covered that. I want to cover something different. Medvedev, he said something, you know, when Russia were about to invade that last, that last meeting he had with Putin, and he told Putin, remember that old Russian proverb that said, don't give them anything because later they are the one that's going to come and give you, give you everything and thing you did not even ask for. And I, I've never seen this in my life. The guy was prophetic because after I watch what is going on right now, the West is in disarray. That means there is no, they did not have a plan. And, 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 and right now they are freestyling. They don't know what they're doing. There is no coherence in what they are doing and what they are saying. And the main reason I'm saying this is I'm a military guy. They said never, never do, never say anything if you are not, if you know you cannot do it. Think about it. Because they have the Western media with them, nobody pay attention to that. But somebody like you, I know you understand that. Understand, United States told Ukraine, I'm going to give you the Patriot missile. Medvedev came and said, listen, if you, put, if you bring those missiles, those, the Patriot missile, not only we're going to attack them, we're going to kill anybody that is around them. And all of a sudden, the United States was like, okay, we're not going to give it to you. This is not, this, this is no yeah, uh, the It's a state of uh, chaos. Uh, we've now had a detective and a retired military man in quick succession, and both of them speaking plain common sense. Uh, it is uh, fatal to ask the uh, former government of Afghanistan. Anyone remember his name? <laughs> Anyone remember the name of the guy who was president of Afghanistan just a few months ago with red carpets and gold embroidered gowns and uh, fancy limousines? Anyone remember his name? None of you remember his name. He's the ex-president of Afghanistan and he couldn't be more X. Those that rely on the promises of the United States are doomed, not just to disappointment, but to fleeing into exile with as many ill-gotten gains as they can carry. Peter is in Alabama on Ukraine. We're getting about the Americas tonight. Go ahead, Peter. Hey, George, thank you for having me. Um, I read on RT this morning that uh, Russian intelligence uh, is claiming that Poland has plans to reclaim 
uh, the lands of, of Western Ukraine that you know historically have belonged to them. And that doesn't come as a surprise. That's something that Scott Ritter predicted, you know, pretty early on in this fight. Um, the only thing that, that has surprised me is why the Poles have sided with Ukraine in the first place. Is how how can they have such short memories with everything the the organization of for you know Ukrainian nationalism did to to, to Polish people during World War II and how they got those lands in the first place. And now it's you know so many Polish soldiers have been killed fighting for this. And I guess my 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 question is is their strategy to um, sacrifice as many poles, you know, you know, they're going to fight, they're going to fight this war to the last pole with the plan that once this is over, um, they can almost like guilt trip or blackmail Ukraine into giving them their lands back. Um, it just seems like such a dumb strategy. It seems like it would have made more sense to just stay neutral, um, till this is all over and then talk about reparations, like what they've been doing with Germany, um, which I don't have a lot of opinions on that. Or if anything, side with Russia, uh, you know, out of anger for who Stepan Mandera was and and what Ukrainian Nazis have done to the Polish people in the past. And so, just the strategy of them sacrificing so many lives with the plan of, of regaining this land just seems so backwards to me. And I'm, and I'm a Roman Catholic like you, and you know, from the outside, it's, I'm always told Poland is a very, very Catholic country, and it's just so disappointing for them um, to have sided this way. Um, if the, if the land is there, the land is there. Well, uh, I, I think, uh, thanks, uh, Peter. I, I, I cut you short only because of the hour. The call was of the highest standard. Uh, the, uh, the thinking, I assume, is that having done everything they can to assist Ukraine, when the Western Ukrainian state falls into a state of collapse, uh, they will then move in to keep order and to protect uh, the ancient Polish lands, particularly the great Polish city of Lvov, uh, which they absolutely consider to be theirs, as, as, uh, as uh, English, as, uh, 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 as Milton Keynes, uh, the uh, Poles regard Lvov as a Polish city. And I suppose uh, a position of neutrality or even belligerence towards the Ukrainian nationalists, whom, as you say, murdered hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Poles, uh, including Polish and Ukrainian Jews, in their collaboration with the Nazi occupation in the Eastern Holocaust, uh, would not have allowed them to pick off the carcass of Western Ukraine quite so honorably from quite such a moral high ground as the one that they now intend to use. The Polish regime intends on what they call uh, establishing an intermare, a corridor of territory between the Black Sea and the Baltics, which uh, will again be uh, revanchist Polish nationalist territory. That's their game plan. We'll see if it works out. Uh, last call before the break. Raymond in Swansea on Taiwan. Change of subject. Go ahead, Raymond. Hello, George. Just to, just, to ball, just to pick your brain on this subject matter. So I've noticed, like, it was your program actually last week that told me that the KMT sort of won the local elections over in Taiwan. And since then, uh, I can't remember the name of the, the Taiwanese uh, president, but she's stepped down as a result of that failure. But none of that has been reported on the media oh. in this country. At all. Not a, not a dicky bird, Raymond. It's yeah, as if it, it never happened. It's like, uh, it's like uh, Labour winning uh, national, local elections and the leader of the Conservative Party resigning. Uh, Rishi Sunak resigning. I'm getting you excited now. Uh, it is as significant as that. The people that want peace and ultimate unity with China swept the boards in the elections in Taiwan and the leader of the separatist party, the US puppet party, was forced to resign her position. Now, that's, for that not even to be news in brief shows the level of mendacity in the Western media about China, does it not, Remy? I completely agree with you on that. And I, in fact, I'm glad that took place because for me, 
that would have been the straw that broke the camel's back, which would have led to, I think, World War Three. Had had that even had she stayed in power with what America were threatening, if China was to invade and blah 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 blah. But I'm glad the Taiwanese people have sort of seen sense in that regard and are looking for a more peaceful sort of like either reunification or a more kind of balanced relationship with China, which is. Brilliant. Well said, Raymond, in Swansea, a Scotsman in South Wales talking about Taiwan, encapsulating the global reach and sagacity of this, the Open University of the Airwaves. I'd like to thank again Critical Cosmetics, Ravi, my dear friend and sponsor. This is his latest cacao, beautifully packaged. I'll be drinking it later, even if it was supposed to be on my face. Ravi, thanks for sponsoring the first hour. Coming up in the second hour, William Sakwa, a Pan-African and a contributor for African Stream on the subject of colonialism, France and Mali. Stay tuned. Visit 220kminc.com today. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, the first hour of the show was sponsored, as always, by Critical Cosmetics. But the second hour currently lacks a sponsor. Gayatri and I made a flying visit in the darkness. It was dark when we arrived. It was dark when we left to Oslo yesterday. A 22-hour flying visit where we never saw the sun in the Norwegian capital. Although in a few minutes we nipped out of the airport when the sun came up and shot a video, which you'll see uh, later in the show about the Oslo Accords, uh, but it came to nothing at least so far. As a matter of fact, the potential sponsor was ill and unable to travel to meet us there. We still hope that we will meet with them at some stage. But if you are able or you know anyone who might be able to put their name on the second hour of the midweek moats, given the numbers of people who will see their name and know about their product, it is absolutely dirt cheap. So get in touch with us on air at Moats TV. I think that's the correct uh, email address. Uh, now, William Sakwa, as I said, is a Pan-African, a contributor for African Stream, and a man who knows his onions so far as Mali is concerned. I want to talk first, William, about Mali, but... We'll broaden it, I'm sure, uh, to the question of colonialism in Africa and the need for pan-Africanism. But let's start with Mali, may we? Uh, it's a very significant development that Mali has booted out what Fidel called the Trojan horses of the NGO industry. How did all that come about? So the problem with uh, the NGOs in Mali was that 
they're not really non-governmental organizations. And what led to them being kicked out in the first place was the fact that France withdrew its assistance to Mali following the coup d'etat that was itself sparked by the government's failure to deal with the terrorist problem created by France itself. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I talked earlier in my introduction uh, about the, the triptych of the economic hitmen, the jackals that do the dirty work if the economic hitmen can't get you, and ultimately the army if the jackals can't do the job. Mali has suffered all three, hasn't it? It, it really has, it really has. And I think what's even, uh, what's most interesting about the, this whole debacle is that the problems originate from France. Uh, Mali suffers a terrorist problem that was created when France invaded Libya to depose Gaddafi and led to creation of uh, slave markets in what was once Africa's wealthiest state. So, I mean, after Gaddafi's ulster, we have all these groups trickling uh, back down the Sahel that led to the rise of uh, jihadism across the Sahel region. And then you have uh, allegations of France itself supporting the problems he created. Uh, we saw during uh, one of the Mali officials called for a UN Security Council meeting to discuss uh, France's assistance in, uh, to the terrorist groups in Mali itself. So, yeah, there's a very clear line which are drawing France to the problems in Mali, be it economically, through ECOWAS, we saw after the coup happened, uh, France used uh, pressured ECOWAS countries to impose sanctions on Mali, even when these sanctions did not go uh, to the interests of the African states. Take Senegal, for example, who does a great deal of trade with Mali. They had to follow the sanctions, but they do not benefit from the sanctions themselves. Well, uh, we'll come on to uh, Africa and, and Russia, Moscow, uh, in a minute. But before I leave the issue of French colonialism, I'm not saying that uh, French imperialism is any better or any worse than any of the other European imperialisms. Indeed, if you were to uh, draw up a league table of morbidity, probably the Belgian colonists were worse even than the French. But the British would take top prize because of the sheer scale uh, of their colonial avarice uh, in Africa. But am I right in saying that of the three that I've just mentioned, and the Portuguese, Spanish, and Italian are no longer of much uh, significance, it is the French that have endured the longest. They continue uh, to cling on in seeking to decide what happens in Africa, who's in power in Africa, what currency they use, what economic policies they follow. Uh, is this because uh, for the French the empire never died? Uh, what is it? What's peculiar about French colonialism? Uh, well, France needs Africa to survive. Without Africa, France will be what you know they call a third world country. Uh, looking at uh, Niger, a country that produces a huge percentage of the uranium used in uh, the French nuclear industry. Despite Niger producing a lot of what France needs, most of its people are poor. The uh, people working in the mines, the communities there suffer the consequences of mining uh, these radioactive materials, but get no benefits. Look at the CFA franc, the currency, the colonial currency imposed on the West African countries where for in exchange for independence, these countries had to hold half their foreign uh, reserve holdings in France and had to take out loans of the money that they stored in France. They had to take loans for their own money. So this is just uh, a few of many examples of how without Africa, France is you know, another small European country, another Portugal probably. Now, of course, all the colonialists are deeply disappointed at Africa in its failure to follow the leader, Joe Biden, uh, into the uh, charge of the Light Brigade against Russia. Uh, why is Africa so reluctant to take the American side against Russia and to join in the uh, chorus of uh, hostility towards 
China and its economic development on the continent? Yeah, well, one the biggest or the most prominent case study is Libya. Africans remember all too clearly uh, what happened with Gaddafi. Libya was okay. Libya did fine. It was the wealthiest country in Africa. And the one organization responsible for that changing was NATO through its uh, assassination of Gaddafi. And it just doesn't stop there. African history with the Russians goes way, way back. Uh, we can go back to how Cuba, Cuban and Soviet forces helped the Angolans push back the apartheid South African forces. Uh, we can look at Cuban, uh, Soviet Cuban assistance in Ethiopia. There's a whole history of, you know, uh, win-win uh, partnership between Russia and Africa. So that and the fact that the West itself is responsible for a lot of what ails Africa today is what, you know, is giving uh, Africa that clarity that, you know, why should we listen to what our enemy is telling us about their enemy? I mean, Africa can make its own enemies, as Museveni said when uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov visited Uganda a few months ago. Well, of course, no African, uh, no uh, Russian rather, and no Chinese ever colonized Africa. It's not exactly rocket science. William, thanks uh, for that uh, interview. The audio was not good on my end. I hope the audience could hear you more clearly than I could, uh, though the content was very obviously uh, important. Now, there's a poll running. The West is being hypocritical in condemning China's COVID lockdown policies. A, yes, 93%. No, 7% on Twitter. Uh, on YouTube, yes, 93%. No, 7%. Telegram, 95%. Yes, 5%. No. It is truly extraordinary, I must say. The total failure, epic fail of the hypocrites of the Western media and political class in the condemnation of China's approach to lockdowns over COVID. I'll take a quick break and then there's much more after this. As the green smoke rose, their faces flashed out pallid green, and faded again as it vanished. Then slowly the hissing passed into a humming, into a long, loud, droning noise. Suddenly a humped shape rose out of the pit, and the ghost of a beam of light seemed to flicker out after it. Forthwith flashes of actual flame a bright glare leaping from one to another sprang from the scattered group of men. It was as if some invisible jet impinged upon them and flashed into white flame. It was as if each man were suddenly and momentarily turned to fire. You'll love that War of the Worlds. I'm loving reading it. As I've said before, it frightens the life out of me and I'm the person reading it. Written, or first published rather, by H.G. Wells in 1897 with extraordinarily prophetic, I mean, stunningly prophetic uh, farsightedness, uh, Wells imagined an invasion of Martians of the earth of England in particular. It turns out, though, that it was actually an allegory of British colonialism in Africa, as we were just talking to William Sakwa about. I'm told that uh, everyone else heard him very clearly, and therefore there was a problem with my audio. My apologies to him, uh, but I uh, couldn't hear him properly at all. Let's take some super chats. Uh, I'm hoping, as you know, to get a Friday night show aimed at the United States, a kind of midnight UK time. 
uh, show for the United States called Moats America. I'm fundraising for it. And the best way you can give is through the Super Chat mechanism. That's how we got this midweek moat, by the way, up and running again. Albert Sontag, a regular donor and friend of the show, gives 10 US dollars. Your show is Thoreau's Moral Agency of Knowing. Thank you for your courage. Wow, Albert, that is uh, really something. I'm touched by that. Mr. Lover gives two pounds, always a very generous donor. Thank you. I'm telling you guys, gives £1.99. Scouse Alarm, my old pal in Liverpool, gives £4.49. Congrats, George, on the ever-growing success of Moat. It's come a long day, a long way since the days of talk sport. Your ever so important voice is so needed. Thank you kindly for that. It's uh, been going nearly, nearly 20 years, the mother of all talk shows, in various incarnations on various platforms, but it has never even dreamt of reaching the numbers of people that we are now currently reaching. Peace Foundation gives 20 Danish crowns. We love Mr. GG. Long live Sir GG. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, our friends in Denmark. Abdi Boos gives 70 Saudi, uh, sorry, South African rand. Hello, George. Thank you so much. Abdi, I want to uh, do a segment on South Africa where quite big things are happening inside the ANC as well as elsewhere in the society. We'll try and put that together over the next few weeks. John Carroll gives £1.79 and says, send in the Clintons. Uh, George Will gives 22 Norwegian crown. Will Ukraine become the European Libya? A very good and well-observed point. I hope not, of course, uh, but it could. It very definitely could. Toy Chung in Hong Kong gives 78 Hong Kong dollars. Wow. Thank you so much for that, Toy. Uh, Rainbow gives £1.79. Pat Daly gives 50 euros. Bravo, Pat. Thank you. Michael Hortzman gives $4.99. Cortez gives $9.99 in the U.S. Uh, now, here's the phone numbers. Uh, people are saying that they uh, are finding difficulty getting through, but that's because the lines are so busy. But if you call us, then we'll take your number and call you back. It's UK 0808196522. That's 0808196522. In the U.S., it's plus one eight four four nine four four double three. Double four plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four and the rest of the world is plus four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. Now I told you that Gatry and I made a flying and as it turned out abortive trip to Oslo over the last twenty four hours, but we did put it to some good use. Take a look at this. Here I am in Oslo, home of the famous Oslo Accords. By bizarre coincidence, I took a taxi this morning, a Tesla, first Tesla I've ever been in. Very nice it is too, Mr. Musk. And of course, hats off to Mr. Nicholas Tesla of Serbia, who invented the whole thing. Anyway, the Tesla taxi was driven by a Palestinian in exile here in Norway, where at this time of the year, it's dark most of the time. His name was Nidal. He knew me well. And of course, it got me reflecting on the, well, 45 years or more that I have been involved in the Palestinian issue. The Oslo Accords were a matter of some rejoicing at the time, though they are at least three decades dead. I supported the Oslo Accords because I was very close to the late and great President Yasser Arafat and he persuaded me that the Oslo Accords will be best that in the geopolitical circumstances he found himself in 
that the Palestinians would ever be able to get. And moreover, that it would be a dynamic process that once the Palestinian leadership, uh, which had gone from pillar to post, even in the time that I had known it, it had been situated in several different places, most latterly in Tunis, in Tunisia, to which I was a frequent visitor. Uh, he persuaded me that once the leadership was back in Palestine, that uh, political dynamic would be unleashed, that would be even better than the Oslo Accords. The Oslo Accords were doomed from the start, I can now see, and they were certainly dead and buried with the Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin assassinated by the political heirs to Jabotinsky and Begin and Shamir, the leaders of the far-right terror groups uh, that then were a fringe of Israeli society and are now absolutely central to it and indeed running the state. The Oslo Accords provided for a steadily growing autonomous area for the Palestinian people and final status negotiations sometime in the future about statehood. But of course, none of that ever happened. Not only are there no uh, remote possibilities of final status, there's no progress even on the interim status. Areas A, areas B, areas C, all the paraphernalia signed ultimately on the White House lawn are all in the ash can of history. The Israeli state absolutely controls the fate of millions of Palestinians in perpetuity since 1967, well over 50 years. These people are without rights and living under brutal military occupation, under siege in Gaza, besieged by sea, by air, by land, millions, two millions in Gaza alone, not able to enter or leave, completely sealed off from the rest of humanity and regularly shelled and rocketed, killed in significant numbers. 2022 actually has been the worst year for Palestinian fatalities in many a decade. So the new government of Israel, led by Benjamin Netanyahu, and he's the moderate in that government, uh, is inheriting a situation where the Palestinians are being shot down like flies. But even on the West Bank, never mind East Jerusalem, which has been illegally annexed and is no longer even on the table for discussion under the Oslo process. Even Ramallah, even the areas supposedly under the control of the so-called Palestinian National Authority, which is not national and has no authority, are entirely at the mercy of the Netanyahu occupation forces. And young people in particular are being gunned down on a daily basis. And that's by the state, never mind the illegal Israeli settlers who are literally running amok in places like Hebron, in places like Naples. So in my conversations with my taxi driver today, I humbly apologized for having supported the Oslo Accord. It was a gallant bid by the Norwegian authorities. I make no criticism of them. The people of Norway, as you can see from the monument behind me, are justly proud of the efforts that they made to bring about peace with justice in the Holy Land. In fact, yesterday, the International Day in solidarity with the Palestinian people, the national flag flew from the city hall. So full march to Norway for trying, but nobody else tried, least of all uh, the settler state, the apartheid state of Israel. A last point. It is now being openly discussed uh, that uh, Israel is not only to be an apartheid state like the old South Africa, 
it is to be a state with three classes of people where the Israeli Jewish population are explicitly and by law the first class citizens. The Israeli citizens of Palestinian origin are to be the second class citizens with fewer rights and with a very much more difficult task of staying alive, operating, owning property, marrying whom they like and so on. But a third class of person will then exist in Palestine. Those are the people that have been under occupation since 1967. And they will have literally no rights at all. Now, if that's not apartheid, I'm a banana. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. And a big shout out to Nidal, my taxi driver, who took us to the airport in the dark in a beautiful Tesla that he was driving, not owning, I think. he It was the first Tesla I'd ever been in, and he was the only person in all of Oslo who knew me that I saw in the 22 hours that we were there. How about that then, Nidal? I salute you and your community there in Norway. Let's go to Canada, where Liam is on the line, about the truckers. Go ahead, Liam. Hello, George. Um, I appreciate you taking my call. How are you? Welcome. Good, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, I've, I've uh, been a long time um, opposer to the Canadian media's coverage of foreign, foreign affairs, being a Syrian-born Canadian, and um, knowing all the lies about the Iraq war, um, the invasion of Afghanistan, the uh, revolution, so-called revolutions of the Middle East, and so forth. But I never um, once uh, thought there would be any propaganda concerning domestic affairs, such as the truckers' um, protests of the COVID policies. So I was, uh, I was, um, I was okay with knowing that the RCMP stopped the protests of truckers because, according to the media we hear, and I don't live. Uh, anywhere close to where the trucks were demonstrating, so I wouldn't know personally. But what the media said is that they were um, funded by a lot of um, armor with them and weapons and whatnot. So um, I didn't see anything wrong with the government intervening. But I would like to ask you a genuine question, which uh, is no way is to interrogate you or anything, but how do you know about... Um, the domestic propaganda uh, of of our media, like how do you know what they're saying is correct or not? Because um, I d- I didn't even give it a second thought when I uh, when I heard that the protests were were stopped. Well, I, ho- I hope you will. I, 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 yeah, well, I hope you will next time give a, a second thought uh, because you already know that your government are liars, and if your government will lie to you about Iraq about Russia, about Israel-Palestine, about uh, Afghanistan, about Libya, about Syria. If you already know that they're a pack of liars, why believe them when they tell you that a section of your own community, people that look like you, talk like you, have the same accent as you, but who work for a living driving trucks, are goose-stepping Nazis and fascists? You really ought to have given a, a second thought, and I hope that you will in future. These yes, truckers I, were yes, blue-collar uh, workers, Liam, trying to make a living, and they were they had their bank accounts stolen by the government. How can that be justified? Last word to you, Liam. Well, um, that's exactly why I called in, is to, um, is to ask how... A person like me, who was raised for most of their life in Canada, but um, strongly opposes everything that Canada does uh, outside of Canada, can be better informed about our domestic 
policies because really we only have one news channel, which is the CBC, and no other yes, country really uh, really focuses on Canada, according to what I know. I mean, I watch Al Mayadeen, I see you on Kalima Hurra. I I don't hear much about Canada because of course we're just America's uh, you know <laughs> dogs in the end of the day. <laughs> but um, how would I be well, better look, uh, informed Lim, on my... Yeah, well, uh, you can be better informed by uh, being a regular viewer here because we covered the trucker story many times. Me and Garland Nixon had many significant interviews about it. Uh, but uh, in general, you know, the, the great Irish journalist Claude Coburn uh, coined the phrase, nothing is true until it's been officially denied. If you want to extrapolate from that, work from the assumption that your government are liars and that you must drill down into anything they say, which you're already doing on international affairs and you must do on domestic affairs too. Wonderful to talk to you. Ronwell is in Chicago. Go ahead, Ronwell. <laughs> Hello, George. Um, before I get to the uh, COVID um, lockdowns and stuff, um, on June and Sanch, um, there, there are five major um, outlets out there are not for um, dropping charges for Assange, just so you know. And now on the COVID um, uh, lockdowns, um, I feel like the, uh, the, uh, the corporate press are being um, hypocrites uh, because I remember... Uh, they are triggering about the um, the, the free freedom truckers in Canada or something like that. And now, and uh, it's just a part of the world, like a new thing. Like they're being cited, and now that they're triggered all the um, uh, COVID uh, lockdowns in China. I mean, I feel like the rest is being hypocrite on the one. So that's really question. Well, uh, it's, uh, look, it's, uh, <coughs> listen, man, it's hypocrisy with a capital H, writ large, as high as a mountain. It is unbelievable that people who treated their own COVID skeptics with such savagery of rhetoric and sometimes physical violence, and in the case of Canada, financial penalty, seizing the money of truck drivers because they had the temerity to stand up to their government's diktat to now be hailing the Chinese COVID skeptics as freedom fighters and the Chinese government as somehow a tyranny. We'll be talking very shortly to Angelo Giuliano, uh, an American in China, about that very subject. Ronwell, thanks for the call. Nice to hear from you again. Uh, Boka Janduma gives six euros, a regular, regular donor, and uh, says, I'm chipping in for Moats America. There you go. Moats America supported in the Netherlands. Barry Lim gives £2.50. Hello gives two euros. What do you think of the World Cup games? Well, I'm watching them uh, avidly uh, and uh, have spoken at some length on Sunday and on last Wednesday about uh, the hypocrisy attached to World Cup coverage. Uh, Nick M's Classic Boxing Channel, wow, gives five pounds. I'm a big fan of you, George. Thank you, Nick. I'm a big boxing man myself. Kenneth gives one pound 79. Africa will be the most populous continent by 2050. That's a new one on me, Kenneth. They'll have to go some, but Certainly, Africa's future is golden if it can overthrow the shackles of U.S. and European colonialism. Golden silence gives two American dollars. Moats America, please, be the bridge for Gonzalo and Scott. That's a reference to the uh, bad blood between uh, Gonzalo Lira and Scott Ritter, both of whom are independently big friends of the mother of all talk shows. Paul is in Ottawa on the truckers. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, thanks for taking my call again, uh, George. Uh, lots to say. Uh, hopefully I can get uh, this as concise as I can. We do have more than one uh, uh, news station. Just want to let everybody know. CBC might be the number one. 
but uh, there are other knees at a lot. Uh, but they're all lock and step uh, with each other. So, you know, you flip on one or you flip on the other, you're hearing the same uh, talking points. Yeah. Um, and especially when it comes to it, it I want to be clear. It wasn't just truckers. I would say the truckers were maybe 10% of the people that were actually down there. 90% of the people when, when, it, when it would rock and roll during the, uh, more in the evenings and, and certainly on the weekends, at least 90% of the people were just supporters of the truckers. They just got labeled truckers because that's the biggest thing that there were like tanks coming in. And that was the real problem for the government was most protests, people come, they stand around, they're easily herded. These guys weren't going nowhere. I mean, you literally had to have uh, an army or, you know, the RCMP basically dressed like the army and, and going ahead and doing what they did. Um, so, of course, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not a ch China hater. China's done a lot of good things. They're uh, bringing people out of poverty, um, moving forward. And, but there's a lot of things about China that I don't like, but it's their country. Uh, on the issue of these crazy lockdowns that they have there, you, you, Trudeau got it right. Yeah, they shouldn't. They shouldn't. Uh, they should have the right to protest, and they should. But there's zero. There, you can't even put a paper between what he did and what um, I, I think he's even been worse than than what China's been. Uh, doing to to their protesters this was like emergency laws freezing bank accounts better in any human being that is a free thinker it wasn't just truckers that got it was just people that you know gave 50 bucks or you know 100 bucks and they were like yep you're supporting a terrorist group we're freezing your account now they didn't do uh, they didn't do everybody, but they sent a message. Hey, look what we can do, which should be just. And unfortunately, that uh, lady that was on before, and I know she's got a great heart, but in her mind, because she was propagandized, um, she's like, well, you know, maybe it was a terrorist organization and maybe those people should have their, well, it has to be. I think she knows better. I think she knows better now. Paul, that was a great call, I must say, in summary. Uh, that was a summation of the situation that would be difficult to break. But we'll hear from China, Angelo Giuliano, coming up right after this short break. Stay tuned. We're charting now with our podcast in 130 countries and territories around the world. And we are in the top 10 in the United Arab Emirates, Indonesia, where we're number one, Croatia, Egypt, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Poland, and Nigeria, and even the Cayman Islands, even the tax dodgers. There's new episodes every Tuesday and Friday. You can listen to the very best of moats anywhere and at any time. You can also get the episodes a day earlier if you are a supporter of mine on Patreon. All my live shows, it's my extensive podcast archive, my audio books narrated by me. So please uh, consider supporting me on Patreon and get your moats podcast wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a five-star review will you well i'm just reading here our podcast is not only within the top five percent of the most followed podcasts in the world and 47 percent of you aren't even subscribed to our podcast so half of our audience have put us in the top 5% globally around the world. And we're number one in several countries, including some of the more 
unlikely, like Saudi Arabia. Uh, so please continue to share the news of the podcast far and wide. Please follow or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and rate it five stars. We're also one of the highest rated too. Angelo Giuliano is a great friend of the show. We've spoken to him many times before. He's a political and financial analyst and long-time resident of China. And he joins us now at an unearthly hour. Angelo, I'm really grateful to you uh, for that. Uh, We've got a poll running. Uh, The West is being hypocritical in condemning China's COVID lockdown policies. On Twitter, 93% say yes, they are being hypocritical. On YouTube, 93%. And on Telegram, 95%. So the hypocrisy isn't working. How does it look to you in China? Well, it's very interesting. I get, uh, I'm here on the ground. And I'm going to give you the scale of the protests uh, that made the headlines all around the world. If you ask average Joe in China, you ask, did you see the protest? They will say, what? What protest? What are you talking about? Uh, I'm going to give you some figures and uh, keep in mind that uh, China has 1.4 billion people. The protest uh, last Saturday, the largest protest in all around China, the total was probably around 10,000 people protested in the street peacefully for a country of 1.4 billion people. I'm going to give you, I'm going to compare to what we had in Switzerland. In Switzerland, a country that is 200 times smaller than China. We had 100,000 people going to the streets because of COVID protest. So uh, the, in scales, you know, if you compare, we are talking about uh, protest 2,000 uh, times less than what we had in Switzerland. So it's a very tiny minority. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean that some people uh, are discontent, are tired of COVID lockdown. Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I do not agree with the zero COVID policy. Uh, I'm against vaccines as well. But the question is, uh, do the Chinese government need to please me or need to please the Chinese? And right now, at this present moment, there is still a majority of people in China that agree with the government. You need also to keep in mind that we are, uh, China is basically in a hybrid war against the collective West. China has been attacked, has been attacked on many, many different fronts. In Xinjiang, terrorists have been financed by the US for uh, separatist, uh, uh, you know, uh, they've been financing separatist and terrorist groups actually in Xinjiang. They've been funding uh, separatist groups in Hong Kong. We had two attempts of color revolution in Hong Kong and also very important, China is very afraid of potential bio-warfare. You saw recently in Ukraine, we discovered there were lots of bio-labs. What those bio-labs are trying to do is to uh, find some virus that actually would match a certain DNA. Well, uh, uh, COVID-19 is not the first time that China has such problem. Remember in 2003, China had SARS. SARS, the spread was not as wide as COVID-19, but the lethality rate, mortality rate was 11%. So China is very, very afraid. So when you look from outside, it seems like irrational. Why would they go through such pain to contain a, a virus that actually is no worse than the flu? Well, there are more reasons. And Chinese people, they believe in their government because, you know, it's, it's a very capable government and they know that uh, it's, it's ultimately to save people, to save life, but maybe there's also some reasons uh, that are related to bio-warfare. So important. Uh, there's also something so very, very important that people need to understand that what happened in, in China, you, uh, there is the foreign hands behind some protest here. Uh, it's uh, somehow an attempt of color revolution. How do color revolution start? Usually they start with the legitimate grievances. Uh, they hijacked legitimate movement. 
So when you look at what happened in Shanghai, there were some Telegram channels, which by the way, those Telegram channels, they were open in October already. The, some Telegram channels were actually monitoring the protest. If you look at who was in those Telegram channels, you had all the, the, the major Western news. You had CNN, you had Radio Free Asia, you had the New York Times, you had the sect Falun Gong, which is financed by USAGM, propaganda arm of the US. And very important, the people managing those Telegram channels were all Chinese living outside China and actually also a prominent uh, dissident that was actually part of the 1989 color revolution attempt in Beijing, Tiananmen Square which is uh, who's financed by some some uh, some NGOs. So you see, they were taking uh, those well, protests in Shanghai. They were taking orders from outside China. So very, very important. They are well, that's pretty, let, yeah. let, let me let me wind that back because that's quite significant uh, news that you're bringing us. You're saying that one of the people organizing the Shanghai protests, which, as you said, uh, reached around 10,000 people across the whole of China, uh, one of the organizers was one of the organizers of the Tiananmen Square events. Who is this person and where are they? Uh, while we are talking, I think it's uh, Xiu Fengzhong. I'm going to get you the name. I I don't have it. One second. Uh, Joe Fenso. I have a, I have his bio right here. Uh, Joe Fenso was a key student leader who helped organize the great democratic movement in Tiananmen Square. Well, keep in mind, it was nothing about democracy there. You know, there were savages. Uh, 300 people died in reality in, in Tiananmen. Uh, actually, nobody died in Tiananmen Square. But in Beijing, that the, during that period, 300 people died. But half of them, 150 soldiers and policemen were beaten to death. Some were even burned to, burned to death, you know. So those are the real information about what happened back then. But this is one of the first color revolution that we experienced. Uh, so you see those people, the, uh, uh, in, maybe in other places, in, in, uh, uh, outside Shanghai, more inside, in third year, uh, third year, uh, uh, cities, uh, they were probably, you know, uh, organic uh, protest. But the scale, the scale for a country of 1.4 billion people, it was maximum 10,000 people protesting in 50 different cities. In some cases, in one city, you had only two or three protesters. That's how big it was. And uh, w w let me ask this. Why are the Chinese government so... Uh, firm uh, about lockdown. Um, they presumably pray in aid that only 5,000 people or so have died from COVID in China as compared to well over a million in the United States and countries like Britain and France and Italy and so on also huge uh, death tolls. Are they still as resolute and committed to the current policy, the policy they followed from the beginning? Or is there any crack appearing in intellectual circles, in political circles, about whether the cost of these lockdowns in economic terms and in terms of opportunity cost, money spent on uh, COVID cannot be spent on cancer, uh, and on the mental health of the people, uh, of being continually tested, continually locked down. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, if uh, uh, in early in the early days of COVID nineteen, the mortality rate was higher. If uh, you were to take the rates that we had in the U.S. Uh, uh, for population of China, would be five million people dying, and this would have been unacceptable for Chinese. Uh, the, the responsibility of the government is to protect their people. But now, after three years, uh, there's a, a frustration. People uh, do want to open up and the government has listened. 
uh, the, the last three days, they're actually starting to relax the, the zero COVID policies. And I think they are gradually getting out of this. Uh, I think it's absurd. It is an, an absurd policy, but they might have uh, uh, other reasons. Uh, but they want to go slowly because they uh, it seems like they're, they're unprepared for a, a big wave all at once. You know, just the capacity, hospital capacity is not there yet. And, and keep in mind that they haven't forced people to take vac vaccines. So, you know, they, they worried that, especially for the older people, that uh, this would be a heavy cost to pay. And just uh, they have a different concept of life and, and, and people's protection. Uh, they look at society as a whole. Uh, it's less individualistic. So this is why they've been so compliant when it comes to a zero COVID policy. But things are changing and the government is listening. Uh, it's going to relax and China is going to open up. Now, there's been some good news for China this week. Uh, the uh, government in Taiwan, uh, widely held to be an instrument of the United States anti-China policy uh, and harboring separatist ambitions, was roundly defeated in the local elections in Taiwan and the KMT, Kuomintang, the traditional founders of Taiwan, who whatever else you can say about them, are Chinese nationalists. They don't believe that Taiwan is a separate country from China. They had a very significant victory. Tell us about that. Uh, let me give you first the background of Tsai Ing-wen. Tsai Ing-wen, she was actually selected by the US uh, already back in 2004. She was, uh, according to uh, some WikiLeaks cables, she was having secret meetings with AIT, which is the American Institute of Taiwan, which is, by the way, the de facto U.S. embassy in Taiwan. So she's been working very closely with the U.S. embassy there. And so they selected her and actually they groomed her and they, they made sure that she would be, you know, on the, um, on the front for being elected. So she is the replica for Taiwan. She's the replica of what you have uh, Zelensky in Ukraine. Exactly the same. Uh, why, you know, uh, because, because for 15 years she's been actually reporting to the U.S. Embassy. Just, just make some research, you know, Vicky Leaks, Taiwan, and you will see she had secret meetings already back then. So this is for the background. Now she's been elected in uh, 2000, uh, 20, why she was elected, it's because there was the, the, the attempt of color revolution in Hong Kong. So they, they, they started massively those, those riots there. Uh, and the, the support she had back then, just before the riots in Hong Kong was 35%. After the riots, she went up to 60%. She, she was not popular on the first place, but she won because of fear mongering about China. Now, she's been ruling for a while and people are very unhappy. Why? Because she's been, the, she's been focusing too much on creating tensions uh, with their major trading economic partner because Taiwan is actually de facto reunited with the mainland. 50% of import and export of Taiwan is with the mainland. So it's de facto reunited with Taiwan. Uh, also, one more thing is that you have also 2 million Taiwanese that work in the mainland. So you have very, very deep connections. So she's been dividing Taiwan and the mainland. And people realize that, you know, you are supposed to work for well-being and you're focusing too much on geopolitics. Uh, so this, the vote you had uh, last weekend was clearly a vote of no confidence. My biggest fear is that we are in 2024 when we are going to, they are going to re-elect another president. Well, they are going, that they might do the same as they did in 2020, uh, start creating some clashes between mainland China and Taiwan and that you would have actually again talks, you know, the fear mongering talks to to push Taiwanese to vote more for pro-independence. And keep in mind, there's a uh, why people are so much 
uh, anti-China. Whenever they hear China, this China bad, you know. Uh, there was a bill passed by the Congress on negative uh, five hundred million dollar per year on negative coverage on China. Just think for one second: how much can you do with that money to manipulate the masses? You know, manufacture consent. Uh, it's massive the bad coverage you're having about China. But again, you know, you have deep pockets institutions that actually this is the, the 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 position of a loser why don't you fight china with you know normal means trade you know uh competition uh there are other ways you know when you when you are playing sports why, why would you be uh, go against the rule uh, just to to you know kill your adversary and 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 somehow just to be on the front uh, you know, uh, paying for bad coverage of your opponent. Well, uh, uh, Angelo, is very low. Uh, yeah, Angelo, let me, as you brought up sport, let me go left field on you. I'm looking at the World Cup. I'm seeing all kinds of countries, some of them absolutely tiny. Uruguay, for example, population of 3.5 million, uh, only half of whom are men. Uh, so 1.7. Five uh, million men, and they're in the World Cup finals every single time. In fact, they've won it twice. I see other small countries like Wales, uh, for example, and many others. Uh, where is China? Why is China not in the World Cup? Why are they not better at football than they currently appear to be? Well, it is not the traditional sport in China. China has been going to football only uh recently china they're good in other other sports it's just it's just not what they do i i you know i i'm italian i grew up in switzerland i started playing football in the street since i was five years old you know that's what you do uh in china what they start the first sport they start playing are not it's not football you know maybe maybe they might have some interest when they go to high school but it's not like something which is deep in our culture in Europe, you know, in some countries like Italy, Spain, we, you know, we, we play, we breathe soccer, you know, that, that's, that, that's uh, for a lot of kids, that's their lives. Uh, for China, you know, they like watching footballs, but it's not, it's not uh, a sport which, you know, historically China has, hasn't been much into sport, into, into uh, football, but it's getting very popular. Now you have kids studying early, uh, and, and probably you, we might we might see China getting better at football in the future. Well, I, I hope so, uh, Angelo. It's a pleasure as always talking to you. You've set us right on a number of things, and I'm grateful to you for it. Uh, the poll uh, overwhelmingly thinks that the West are absolute hypocrites on the issue of China and COVID. Just before I go, I want to make some. A closing uh, observations. I get a lot of abuse uh, from people in America that don't listen properly. They imagine that because I am viscerally hostile to Joe Biden and the so-called Democrats, that that means I'm a supporter of the Republicans and of Donald J. Trump. In fact, Neither of those is true. I'm not with either of these two big parties, two cheeks of the same backside. Even if we could agree which was the lesser attractive cheek, I still wouldn't be prepared to choose between them. I'm one of those that calls on, let me do so again here and now, my good friend Jimmy Dore to run as a third party candidate for the People's Party uh, of America, for a third force to emerge. That's what I want to see in America. And I'm more than happy to uh, give whatever advice and experience that I myself have to any people of goodwill who want to build that third force. As I've said before, if my good friend Dr. Jill Stein were to be the Green Party nominee again, 
I would, of course, support her for President of the United States. If Tulsi Gabbard would run as an independent presidential candidate, I would support her. I would not be happy to see Donald Trump back in the White House, but I'd be very, very happy if Joe Biden wasn't. I'd be very, very happy if Kamala Harris wasn't, even if that meant that Donald Trump would have another term as president of the United States. You see my point? I regard the US Democrats as the greatest threat to peace on the planet without any scintilla of hesitation. I say that to you. I believe that the world is much more dangerous with Biden and Harris and the Democrats in power. And therefore, I'd be happier if anybody could replace them as president of the United States. Doesn't mean I've become, despite my red tie, a Republican, at least not a US Republican. It doesn't mean I've become Trumpist or a devotee of the great orange Hulk. I'm not either of those things. But I've got to tell you, I think Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are a clear and present danger to the American Republic. And even more importantly, from my point of view, they're a clear and present danger to the peace of the world. Avoid World War III. Get rid of Joe Biden. That's all, alas, that I've got time for. But the good news is, God willing, I will be back on Sunday at a different time, 7 p.m. UK time. That's the usual Sunday time, but different to this time. And I'm doing everything I can to find a sponsor for the second hour of the show. Help me, please, with that. Good night.